أعلن استقالة الحكومة الاستقالة كان ينبغي أن تحصل منذ زمن طويل ماذا عن آلاف الخبراء الروس والإيرانيين ومقاتلي حزب الله؟ Good afternoon and thank you for watching us on Future TV. I'm Linda Tamim and I'm delighted to be joining you all for the English Bulletin. And now for today's headlines. Retiring Police Chief Major General Ashraf Rifi will hand over his post to Brigadier General Roger Salam. Syrian rebels seize a key town on a main highway between Damascus and the south. And on the occasion of Good Friday, hundreds of Christians are marking the crucifixion of Jesus in the Holy Land. Retiring Police Chief Major General Ashraf Rifi is expected to hand over his post to Brigadier General Roger Salam tomorrow. A statement issued by the Internal Security Forces said an official handover ceremony will be held at the Beirut Police Headquarters at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Prime Minister Najib Mikati announced the resignation of his government last week citing the government's failure to pass a proposal to extend Rifi's term, who will retire on the, April, on the 1st of April. Mikati also attributed his resignation to the blocking of a decision to form a committee to oversee parliamentary elections early next June. And progressive social party leader Walid Jumblat says Lebanon's new government must include the, the various political parties. Jumblat's, Jumblat has blamed Hezbollah for the country's failed dissociation policy toward events in Syria. He said the militia followed Iranian orders to defend the Syrian regime. He added the national dialogue should aim at stopping Hezbollah's involvement in Syria. However, Jumblat was upbeat that Hezbollah will not impose a specific prime minister and refused to propose any candidate to head the new government. Regarding the issue of extending the term of police chief Major General Ashraf Rifi, Jumblat says the head of the internal security forces will go into retirement until efforts to bring him back succeed. And the Syrian Navy gunboat has fired at a Lebanese fishing boat off the northern coast of Arida, wounding a fisherman. Security sources said the Syrian gunboat entered Lebanese territorial waters at dawn and opened heavy machine gun fire at the Lebanese boat, wounding Khalid Ahmad Ali. Ali was transported to a local hospital in Tripoli. Reports say the Syrian Navy has often fired at fishing boats in Lebanese territorial waters since the uprising against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> Moving on to Syria, rebels have seized a key town on a main highway between Damascus and the south in their latest advance in Dara province on the border with Jordan. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said that a child was among the 10 civilians killed in the fighting for the town over the past 24 hours. At least 15 rebels and a media activist were also killed, along with 12 loyalist troops. The capture of Dal comes a day after a loyalist MP from the province raised the alarm in parliament. The watchdog added new violence erupted in several districts on the outskirts of the capital. And Russia says the decision to give the Syrian opposition a seat at the Arab League summit denies any plans for peaceful settlement in Syria. Opposition leader Maaz al-Khatib took Syria's vacant seat at the Arab summit in Doha earlier this week, which also lent its support to giving military aid to the rebels fighting Assad. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov added this move has placed peace mediator Lakhtar Brahimi's mandate in question. Russia has supported Brahimi, who, uh, who has met with Russian and U.S. officials in recent months as part of an effort to end the violence in the country. And today is Good Friday, and for the occasion, hundreds of Christians are marking the crucifixion of Jesus in the Holy Land. Worshippers have packed Jerusalem's Holy Sepulchre Church, where Jesus is believed to have been crucified, buried, and resurrected for a morning mass that started Good Friday events. From Jerusalem to Italy, Yumna Naufal reports. Palestinian Christians mark Good Friday with a procession in the West Bank after they were refused entry to Jerusalem to pray. Carrying large wooden crosses and Palestinian flags, the Christian faithful walk near the Israeli settlement of Jilo on the southern edge of Jerusalem and near the West Bank town of Beit Jala, stopping at short intervals to pray. The followers mark the stations of the cross, which denote 15 significant moments during Jesus' walk to where he was crucified. 
Zafiat Abu Aid, a spokesperson for the Palestinian Liberation Organization, said the procession underlined Palestinians suffering as well. Via Dolorosa, Latin for way of suffering in Jerusalem's old city, is believed to be the route Jesus Christ took before he was crucified. During the Easter period, thousands of pilgrims visit Jerusalem to walk in his footsteps. For many, the procession is not just a religious event, it is a protest against Palestinian Christians being stopped from visiting the Holy City. Across the waters, about two dozen Filipinos were nailed to crosses on Good Friday in an extreme display of devotion that the Catholic Church looks down upon as a form of folk religion but appears powerless to stop. Ruben Inage embarked on his 27th year playing Jesus Christ in the annual Passion Play in the village of Kutud, about 80 kilometers north of Manila. Other devotees in maroon robes and crowned with wreaths carried life-size crosses under the scorching sun as they made their way along a dusty path to a mound that resembles Calvary, taunted by townsfolk portraying Roman soldiers. The reenactment of the Passion of Jesus Christ draws thousands of tourists to the Pampanga region to watch barefoot penitents flagellate themselves in a series of crucifixions on an artificial hill. The practice, which took hold in the province about 60 years ago as a form of religious vow by poor people seeking forgiveness, a cure for illness, and the fulfillment of other wishes. And in Italy, Pope Francis' decision to hold a Holy Thursday rite in which he washes and kisses the feet of 12 people at a youth prison made a strong impact on those present. Two young women were among the 12 inmates whose feet Pope Francis washed and kissed at the traditional ceremony. It took place at the Casal del Marmo prison on Rome's outskirts, the first time a pontiff has included females in the rite. The ceremony has been traditionally limited to men because all of Jesus' apostles were male. A Vatican spokesman said two of the 12 whose feet were washed were also Muslim. While the former Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio included women in the right when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, it was the first time women had taken part in a Papal Holy Thursday ceremony. Taking the ceremony to a youth prison was also a Papal first, and Francis, who was elected only two weeks ago, said it was important for him to be closer to those who are suffering. And coming up next, South Africans pray for anti-apartheid icon Nelson Mandela after he spent his second night in hospital. That and more after the break. And welcome back. Fifteen people were killed when five car bombs struck mosques in Baghdad and the northern Iraqi city of Kirkuk. The blast all struck outside of the mosques within an hour of each other during Friday prayers. Officials say more than 80 people were also wounded in the deadly attack. The attacks come amid a spike in violence nationwide as the country prepares for its first elections in three years due to be held on April 20th. And North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un says his rocket forces are ready to attack U.S. positions. North Korea puts its missile units on standby to attack U.S. military bases in South Korea and the Pacific after the U.S. flew two nuclear-capable stealth bombers over the Korean peninsula. North Korea's center, central news agency quoted Kim saying North Korean forces should mercilessly strike U.S. military bases in the Pacific and in South Korea in the event of any reckless U.S. provocation. On the other hand, U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel accuses North Korea of increasing the danger on the Korean peninsula while defending his country's decision to send stealth bombers to the region. The, the North Koreans have to understand that um, uh, what they're doing is, is very dangerous and they have some options. They can take another approach to uh, a better future, but what they're doing now uh, is not uh, the way to, to do that. And uh, we have security issues here that we have to protect uh, and commitments in our security uh, interests. So, uh, no, I don't think we're doing anything uh, extraordinary or provocative or, or out, of the, uh, uh, out, out of the orbit of what nations do to protect their own interests and assure, as uh, the general said, uh, especially to, uh, not only to our South Korean ally but to our other allies in that region, uh, that um, that uh, we we must make make clear that these provocations by the north are taken by uh, by us very seriously and we'll respond to that.
and Iran, North Korea and Syria have blocked the adoption of a UN treaty that would regulate the multi-billion dollar international arms trade. Australian Ambassador and Meeting Chair Peter Woolcott announced there was no consensus for the adoption of the treaty after the three countries raised their nameplates refusing to join consensus. In fact, the adoption of the treaty requires the agreement by all UN member states. Iran's UN Ambassador Mohammad Khazai said the drafts treaty is very susceptible to, politi to politicization and discrimination and ignores the legitimate demand to prohibit the transfer of arms to those who commit aggression. Supporters of the treaty said it was not adopted. They would go into the General Assembly to put the draft a vote where they expect overwhelming approval. And in France, President François Hollande says he plans to alter his election campaign proposal for a 75% tax on income above 1 million euros. Hollande says he is aiming at putting the burden on big companies rather than individuals. Speaking at an interview on France 2 television, he said he would redraft his original super tax plan, which has been rejected by the Constitutional Council. Hollande, who is battling to reduce the public deficit in a climate of stale growth, said no new taxes will be imposed this year and that no tax rises were planned for 2014. On another note, Hollande says Mali should hold its elections in July. He added that France will reduce its, troops num its troop numbers in Mali starting next month. And now for a quick look at other news around the world. Six people were killed and 18 were injured when a suicide bomber targeted a senior Pakistani police commander in Peshawar. Police say the dead included three members of the security forces and three civilians, including two women. They added the attacker was targeting Abdul Majid Marwat, the head of a paramilitary police force, who was not hurt after the blast. So far, no group has claimed responsibility for the attack. Shipyard President Nikos Anastasiadis said the situation is under control in Cyprus and his country has no intention of leaving the euro. The president spoke a day after banks reopened their doors following an almost two-week shutdown to prevent a run on deposits by panicked Chipriots as the island flirted with bankruptcy. He said the government will implement the necessary reforms so as to encourage investment and to restore the economy. An Oklahoma dentist may have exposed thousands of these patients to hepatitis and HIV. Health officials recommended that 7,000 patients of a Tulsa dentist undergo tests for the diseases. Complaints against the dentist led investigators to discover multiple safety issues, including faulty sterilizing equipment. The executive director of the State Board of Dentistry said it was an unprecedented event. And former South African President Nelson Mandela is responding positively to treatment for a recurring lung infection. The anti-apartheid icon, who became South Africa's first black president, was admitted to hospital overnight. President Jacob, Jacob Zuma has sought to reassure South Africans that Mandela was in good hands, as his doctors reported some progress in his treatment. Mandela has become increasingly frail in recent years and has been admitted to hospital several times since last year. He was hospitalized earlier this month, receiving what a presidential spokesman described as a successful medical test. Many of Mandela's supporters held prayers for his recovery. The Nobel Peace Prize laureate received well wishes from global figures, including U.S. President Barack Obama, after he was admitted to hospital. Uh, obviously, we're all uh, deeply concerned with uh, uh, Nelson Mandela's health. Uh, he's a hero, I think, to all of us. Uh, I'm sure that I speak for uh, the other leaders here. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will be... Uh, keeping him in our thoughts and prayers and his entire family. Uh, you know, he is uh, as uh, strong physically uh, as he's been in character uh, and in leadership uh, over so many decades. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, he, will, uh, he will come out of this uh, latest challenge. But uh, we all recognize that uh, he has given uh, everything to his people, the people of South Africa, uh, to the people of the continent, and he's ended up being an inspiration uh, to all of us. Uh, when you think of uh, a single individual that, that embodies the kind of leadership qualities that I think we all aspire to, uh, the first name that comes up is Nelson Mandela, and, uh, and so we wish him uh, all the very best. And this marks the end of our bulletin for today, and now here's a recap of our top stories.
Retiring Police Chief Major General Ashraf Rifi will hand over his post to Brigadier General Roger Salam. Syrian rebels seize a key town on a main highway between Damascus and the south. And on the occasion of Good Friday, hundreds of Christians are marking the crucifixion of Jesus in the Holy Land. And that's it from me and the news team here at Future TV. Catch me again tomorrow, same time, for more of the world's top stories. Good night.